Okay, this lecture is going to be about the medieval church, how it's organized, why it's important, and then in class, we'll be evaluating what's important on Wednesday. One of the things we're looking at on Wednesday is the idea of iconography again. And this is the image we'll be looking at on Wednesday and analyzing. Okay, take, a, take a good look at it now, uh, kind of what it's all about. Uh, some very interesting imagery in here. We're going to have you discuss this part on Wednesday a little bit in terms of this idea of why the church is important and what kind of role the church played in everybody's uh, daily life. But let's kind of go look at the bigger picture of the church here. Uh, for our lecture's sake today. Uh, in terms of the church, it has a hierarchy to it. The Catholic Church in Europe at this time, and even still today, uh, hierarchy means it's a ranked structure. So at the very, very top is the Pope. Uh, pope is considered kind of the father of the church, kind of going up with St. Peter. Um, and the Pope is considered to be a cardinal. Uh, cardinals are appointed leaders. The Pope himself actually is the Cardinal of Rome, and so he's considered to be that way, but he's elected from the group of cardinals. Uh, if you remember from last year, when Pope Benedict XVI uh, stepped down and Pope Francis I was elected, uh, he was elected from the group of cardinals. And then when the cardinals meet, they select one cardinal to become the new pope, and then they put the white smoke on the chimney, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's kind of where that idea fits in. But the cardinals are elected group, kind of the elected kind of congress, if you will, of the church. The pope kind of being elected from that group as like a president or a leader. Um, after the archbishop, these are kind of like regional governors. Uh, the archbishops. Uh, to get a large area, you may have an archbishop of, of a, you know, a state or of a country. You may be an archbishop of France, so on and so forth, or a large city. After that, you have bishops as well. Bishops are control of a smaller area of land. So maybe you have a bishop of, of a, you know, a state or of an area. I know in the uh, way the Catholic Church is done here in Wisconsin, I believe there are three or four uh, different bishops that cover. One, La Crosse, Green Bay, Milwaukee, and in Madison. Uh, where they have everything kind of set up to cover, they kind of stay in four parts. And very lastly, you have the priest. The priest is going to be in the parishes and the cities, uh, kind of the day-to-day -day operations. The Catholic gives a little more detail here. Um, the Pope obviously is a very, very powerful person this time. Uh, in fact, a lot of times in this case, the Pope is a higher rank than a lot of the kings. A lot of the kings actually follow the Pope set. And one example here is Pope Gregory the uh, First. He was a Pope from 590 to 604 uh, A.D., and what he really did is he really took control of papal lands. He really took control of Rome and kind of said, okay, here's Rome, here's the Vatican, this is our piece of land, this is what we're going to use. And he really expanded power and really tried to make more of Europe Christian. Uh, this time we had the Germanic tribes, they have their, their religion that they, they brought with them uh, from the Germanic areas. He sent a lot of missionaries out to convert people and kind of link to the other Christianity. Uh, he was also bringing to music, that kind of thing. He's presented the patron saint of music today. Uh, where he creates what's called the Gregorian chants, which we'll look at in a minute here. Uh, the bishops and, our, and our abbots played our big role to archbishops in medieval Europe. Basically, uh, the church controlled about one third of the land in Western Europe. The church owned a ton of land. And because they owned so much land, they didn't want so much fighting happen. And as more and more of these different groups like Clovis and the Franks and whoever else became Christian, they tried to curb how much fighting was actually happening. They found that people were fighting each other, killing each other too much, and um, they basically made it so you can only fight 40 days a year in combat. Okay, so kind of said that basically people can only fight so often that way people aren't getting killed, so it's not getting destroyed, so that's a little better for people. Uh, they also try to curb heresy. Uh, heresy is people who are non-believers in, in the Christian church. And so we see things like Inquisition, people forced to become Christian, those kind of deals. Because they own so much power, uh, almost, almost land had so much power in the church, um, these groups kind of put taxes on people too. One tax a lot of people had to pay was called the tithe. The tithe was one tenth of your assets given to the church. So if you made ten dollars, one dollar went to the church all the time. If your crop you made ten bushels of corn, uh, one bushel of corn or wheat, whatever you want to call it, would go to the church then. And there was also Peter's pence. Basically, you paid a penny per person every uh, so often. And some examples of how these guys pay, played a big role in the larger area of church, especially in terms of taxes and those kind of things. Going down here, we see the priests as well. And the priest was more on the day-to-day -day basis. Here's an actual old church from the 100s uh, AD uh, in Europe. And basically, your parish priest did all the kind of things for all the sacraments. And so it would be baptism, marriage, forgiveness, confession, last rites for the dying. Typically, you had to have a donation paid when you got these services. Uh, he also performed the services, typically all in Latin. And, uh, and they perform the services a lot of times this way. A lot of times, uh, early on, Gregorian chants, uh, supposedly done by Pope Gregory, were using his services as well. I'm going to play an example for you here of a Gregorian chant. Uh, and what it sounds like. 
get this to work here. Do the example of a Gregorian chant. Uh, basically, the way to easily remember all the Latin words that went into the to the service. They were done in harmony with the uh, choir of all male monks or mixed choirs. Very, very pretty. Still used today. Um, reason I have these chants and the priest is that uh, the church service all done in Latin. Well, if you're in Germany, in Britain, in France, wherever, people didn't speak Latin. A lot of people could not read or write anything, let alone Latin. And so only the clergy really knew what was written, what was in the services. Uh, beside that, um, the priests served a lot of other roles too. A lot of times they were the local doctor. If you got hurt, you went to the church. If you had problems or poverty, you went to the church. Uh, a lot of times the money that went into the church was used for the people. You either build a new church, a bigger church, a better church, used to feed the poor, take care of the injured. A lot of things were used that way in terms of local priests. Uh, the monastic movement was not a big idea here. This is St. Benedict in the picture here. And uh, the idea of monastic movement or becoming a monk became real popular in the 5th century, created around 300 or so. Um, and basically, it's a reaction against increasingly worldliness in the church. It became this uh, material kind of society where, where people were getting rich, a lot of money was coming in as some of the priests and the bishops and archbishops, archbishops were some of the richest people in Europe. And so basically, it was a, a secluded religious community where people would get together and go off in a little area by themselves, live in a, a communal environment, and live for the church. A lot of times an abbot would rule the monastery where monks would be, and for a Benedictine monk, you took vows. Basically, you said you would live a certain way the rest of your life. Uh, the vow was of chastity, which means you would not marry or have any kind of relations with the opposite, uh, opposite gender. Uh, you had poverty, means you give away all your worldly possessions, just live what you needed to live. You got your food, you got your shelter, it's all you needed. And lastly, you had obedience. So you would be 100% obedient to the church, 100% obedient to the abbot who ruled your monastery. And if you fail to do certain things, you can be punished, uh, even physically punished for these things. Um, women who joined these orders were called nuns. And so they had a very simple life as well, though they were more active in the public. A lot of times monks would kind of stay inside um, the monastery. Uh, this would be the convent for nuns where you kind of see the outside part where people live, the inside courtyard. Um, women, nuns were more outside in the world. Uh, they would do. Uh, they would teach people uh, spinning, weaving, needlepoint, teach people to read. Actually, if you want to become an educated woman at this time in history, the only way to do that was to become a nun a lot of times. They could read, they could write, same thing with monks. And so uh, a lot of times the abbess ruled that convent where they lived. And so if you want to be an intelligent person, you know, a monk or a nun wasn't a bad thing. In fact, a lot of very rich people wanted their kids to become priests, monks, or nuns uh, because they mean they learned how to read and write and got an education. Here's an example of a medieval monk's day. You can see in the summertime, they start around uh, 1.30 in the morning. You get done around 8.30 at night. And you can kind of see where people are where you're sleeping. A lot of times your day is involved in church, of, eat, uh, of work. Uh, you only eat twice a day. That's about it. But a very, very long schedule. Notice here the winter schedule is a little shorter. Basically, your day is done when the sun goes down. And so you can kind of see how the day works that way. When it says work here, it could be working in fields, working in gardens, could be making wine or beer. Those kind of things be part of the work. The other part of the work within what's called the scriptorium, where monks would basically copy down manuscripts. They'd copy the Bible. They'd copy Greek, Greek and Latin texts. Uh, literally all day, just copy things down word for word. It was the only way that books actually survived this time. It's because monks were copying them, monks were reading them, monks were learning them. Other people weren't reading and writing. Other people were trying to survive. The monks were a little more comfortable. They could sit and copy these books down and reprint them for everybody. And they create some gorgeous manuscripts. They're called illuminated manuscripts. They have these beautiful pictures in here in color, all hand-drawn, all hand-written. Uh, some going back to the time of Charlemagne. These illuminated manuscripts today are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. A lot of times they're printed on what's called vellum. Uh, paper wasn't available really at that time yet. And so the stuff called vellum was made on calf skin or goat skin. And so these books are basically with other pages still exist in some cases. It's very, very cool to see. You really, How important is this time period? Um, people believe in, in a couple things. If it's heaven and hell, you don't obey the church, well then bad things happen to you. Kind of really regulated people's behavior on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of times the bishops, priests, and monks were treated differently. 
Uh, they got special courts. Uh, if they did something wrong, they got off easy a lot of times. Uh, they were the ones that could read and write. They knew the laws. They knew the way things were going. And a lot of times they were richer than uh, the common person. Uh, and honestly, we look at a church. Well, the church you look at, we'll look at some examples in a second here. They're a big building. They're beautiful, even the little ones. Um, you know, people are living in, you know, stick and mud huts. Churches are made out of stone. Obviously, it's going to be uh, a more, a bigger building. And uh, people had to pay the tax to help pay these uh, power off. And the church really had a lot of power in government. Uh, the, the government rulers, the leaders, they listened to the church, uh, the, the bishops and the popes, and really followed their rules. And we said about the Dark Age churches and how they use architecture in the, the biggest, most beautiful buildings. Look at these pictures here, you kind of think to yourself, what architectural elements from Rome and Greece are in here? You might see arches, you might see columns, all those kind of things. And as we move from the Dark Age, quote unquote Dark Ages, early, early Middle Ages to or the High Middle Ages, kind of later on, we'll see some big differences. First off, in the Dark Ages, the kind of the early Middle Ages, it's very, very Roman. It's rounded arches, it's domes, big, huge, thick walls. They're short buildings, they're very square. Uh, they have pillars in them. But as we get further and further, say, after year 1000, walls get thinner. Arches, you have a peak to them, which allows them to support more weight. We create something called the flying buttress. We'll talk about it later on. I know buttress, funny word, whatever. Um, we had taller, bigger buildings because we have better ways to support the weight and a lot more gorgeous decoration. We start having what's called cathedral ceilings. Have those in your house. Very, very tall buildings, very, very tall ceilings, big, huge rooms. Let's take an example of now. Here's one of the older churches you'll see. You'll see the arches here. Yeah, right there. The arches, but still a pretty tall building in terms of stuff. Uh, here we see another older church. We have the arches. It was very tall. Arch right here. Pretty short, pretty squat yet. You see pillars in here from Rome, those kind of ideas in Greece. Uh, but here we get the higher, higher characters and see that things change a little bit. Uh, here obviously is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Uh, it just took, building took years and years and years and years and years to build. Um, but we see how tall the, the ceiling here is compared to here. Much taller. See the arches have a peak to them now versus just being a regular arch. There's some regular arches in here as well. A much taller building, much bigger building. The walls are a lot thinner now because they have better ways of supporting the walls. Uh, here you see the, the decoration. You have the, uh, the stained glass windows, much taller, much bigger. And you kind of see how the, the, the uh, arches here are more pointed in terms of, uh, of how they're designed. Um, you kind of see the inside here now, much grander scale building. And the reason I can do this is because something called a flying buttress. Um, flying buttress basically meant we have an extra arch on the outside of the wall. And so this is going to be the wall inside right here, okay? And the flying buttress was an extra arch on the outside that helped distribute the weight. That way you can have a thinner wall, a taller wall, but all that weight pushing down comes out here down to the flying buttress, not just on uh, this wall right here and the arches right down here. And so it's an extra set of arches that help support all the weight uh, where the weight is going uh, from the building. And so the flying buttress was a big idea to the building larger, grander scale buildings. I'm talking about cathedrals. <coughs> These gigantic churches. I'll tell you a cathedral is a seat of a bishop. So you're going to see a cathedral where a bishop is. And we have there are some gorgeous cathedrals in the, in the, in the United States. Uh, the one up in St. Paul, Minnesota is just amazing. What you see about, see about cathedrals though is that they always are in the shape of a cross. So here's an example of uh, in Vels where you see kind of a cross shape here. Okay, and you have those flying buttresses on the outside uh, and a lot of great, gorgeous decoration. Uh, that's this day's lecture. This is due for Wednesday, folks. We're going to talk about this in class a little bit. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you guys then.